Hi friends, Father Kerry Walters here, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Church, and this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one on converting like a monk, not like an American. In previous videos in this Like a Monk series, we have examined monastic values and how we who live in the outside non-monastic world can incorporate them in our own lives. We've looked at reading the Bible like a monk. We've looked at obeying like a monk. We've looked at practicing stability like a monk. And today we take up converting like a monk. Now you will recall that obedience and stability and conversion are the three vows that Benedictines take. Most immediately, what these vows mean, of course, are obedience to the abbot of the monastery in which the monk dwells, remaining in the monastery in which the monk uh, dwells, and making sure that one tries to increasingly uh, practice the rules and regulations and discipline that the monastery uh, encourages. But we've also seen with the other vows that we've examined so far that there is a deep meaning to these three vows. And that deep meaning can be incorporated in our own lives. So for instance, we learned that to obey really means to listen with the ears of one's heart, to be alertly attentive to the voice of God. And we learned that practicing stability means persevering in our desire for God and in the spiritual disciplines that we take up in order to draw us closer and closer to God. And both of those have a great deal to say about the vow that we're going to discuss today, conversion. Those of us who are Americans, whenever we hear the word conversion, I will bet dollars to donuts that what we have in mind is a sudden and highly emotional experience in which we give ourselves over to God, in which we are born again, to use the expression that evangelists in this country are especially fond of. Uh, this kind of conversion, this spontaneous and highly charged uh, understanding of, conver of conversion has deep roots in the American psyche. It was the kind of conversion that was experienced in the 18th and early 19th centuries in the so-called First and Second Great Awakenings, these huge revivalist movements that swept through parts of the nation. It's the kind of conversion that we are used to hearing about and witnessing um, from televangelist uh, shows. It's the kind of conversion that um, we are frequently asked to experience by our evangelical friends. It is a once and for all, once and done kind of commitment to God. That is not, however, the monkish notion of conversion. For the Benedictine tradition, conversion is a lifelong process, and indeed, the process may continue after life. To be converted is not a once and done deal. It is a process in which we grow incrementally into the kind of person that God desires us to be. And the more we grow into that person, the closer we come to God. So for example, hearing with the ears of the heart will enable us to continue the process of conversion perseverance in prayer and fasting and other spiritual disciplines will help us mature in our conversion, in our lifelong pilgrimage to God. In fact, it could well be the case that when we're talking about conversion in the monastic sense, a better word might be pilgrimage than conversion, because the word conversion, as I've already suggested, is so heavily laden with the evangelical understanding of once and done, a highly emotionally charged event rather than a lifelong process. Now, if you read the rule of Benedict, um, you'll discover that um, what uh, is meant by conversion is a little bit uh, ambiguous. And the reason for that probably stems back to um, a mistranslation of the original Latin. There are actually two ways in which Benedictines refer to the conversion that they're speaking about. Um, one is conversation uh, morum suorum, and the other is conversio morum. Now, the first means probably something like a way of life. 
and the second means something probably like a change in manners or behavior. Um, there has been a huge outpouring of scholarship trying to suss out the difference between these two understandings of conversion. For my money, it seems to me that they are very compatible. Conversion in the monastic sense is a change of behavior that incorporates a whole new way of life. More specifically, what does that mean? What does this change of behavior that brings into focus a new way of life for us mean? Well, I think it's helpful to go back to the Greek word for conversion, metanoia. Now, metanoia is a compound word, meta on the one hand and nous on the other. Meta simply means beyond and nous means mind. So conversion is a process of going beyond one's current way of looking at relating to, responding to the world and God and oneself and one's sisters and brothers. To convert in this sense is to somehow drastically change the way in which we respond to reality. But when I say drastically, I don't necessarily mean suddenly, that once and done deal. The drastic change is incremental. We can only take so much change at any given time. And God in God's wisdom recognizes that. Hence, once again, conversion as a process rather than a sudden and highly charged event. What does it mean to look at the world in a different way? You know what? I think that it means to recall or to remember what we once knew, the way in which we once looked at the world but which got clouded as the years passed by. The Hebrew word for repentance is helpful here, it seems to me. Teshuba, teshuba. And what it means literally is a turning back, a returning. Or take the Greek word for truth, aletheia. It literally means unforgetting. To be in the truth, to recognize truth, is to unforget or to remember that which one once knew, but for one reason or another got jammed into the recesses of one's unconsciousness. To convert, to experience metanoia, to turn back, is to somehow recapture the innocence with which we were born. An innocence which allows us to gaze at the world with pure vision rather than with all of the filters that life eventually throws up before us. To see the world as an act of love. To recognize the image of God and hence the inherent dignity in all people whom we meet and in ourselves as a matter of fact. To look at the world and recognize that it is not a hurly-burly jumble of chaotic events nor is it just a kind of boring one damn thing after another, but is instead a majestic creation which is headed towards a fulfillment ordained by God. That's what it means to grow into this innocence which we once had and which by the grace of God, conversion, the process of conversion, will help us to recapture, such that by the time we're through with this life and ready to fall asleep in the Lord, we have returned to the childish innocence with which we were born. This lifelong pilgrimage towards God, then, is a pilgrimage away from spiritual myopia to 2020 spiritual clarity. And it takes a lifetime, again, if not more, to achieve. This is the monastic understanding of conversion, my friends, a lifelong process. And what about the change of manners that this new way of looking at the world will bring about? Well, I can think of no better thing to do than to read you a uh, portion of Benedict's rule. This is from chapter 72. It is the um, penultimate chapter uh, in the uh, rule of Benedict. You can see how uh, time-worn my own uh, copy of the rule of Benedict has become. Time-worn, kind of like me, as a matter of fact. This is what Benedict says. Just as there is a wicked zeal of bitterness, which separates from God and leads to hell, so there is a good zeal, 
which separates from evil and leads to God and everlasting life. This, then, is the good zeal which monks must, must foster with fervent love. They should each try to be the first to show respect to the other, supporting with the greatest patience one another's weaknesses of body or behavior, and earnestly competing in obedience to one another. No one is to pursue what he judges better for himself, but instead what he judges better for someone else. To their fellow monks, they show the pure love of brothers. To God, loving fear. To their abbot, unfeigned and humble love. Let them prefer nothing whatever to Christ, and may Christ bring us all together to everlasting life. The key word that we hear again and again in that particular chapter is love, isn't it? The love that we gradually grow back into as we convert through our life, as we travel the pilgrim's way to God, the source of love. And all of our actions in the world become increasingly saturated by love, such that we put others first, such that we always attentively listen to their needs, their wants, instead of allowing our own to drown out their voices and God's. So my friends, there you have it. Conversion is a lifelong process in the monastic tradition, not simply a one-off event. It seems to me that those of us who live in the world can really profit by this understanding of what it means to convert. I'm Father Kerry Walters, and this has been another Holy Spirit moment. Thank you so very much for watching. If you are of a mind, I invite you to subscribe to uh, Holy Spirit Moments. You can do so simply by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you, my friends. God bless each and every one of you. I'll see you again real soon.